you, Lisa. It's fun to be here sort of in virtual existence. And if we were live, we would be up on the mountain and it's so cold up there. I think it would be sunny, but chilly, but um, we would have a different approach. We'd go out and see what birds are there. The birds are moving in, as a lot of you know, the migrants are moving in. And um, so we're seeing a lot of bird activity, but I love this idea of a backyard naturalist version of the rally. And when I thought about that, I thought there's different ways you can approach that. You can think of process, you can think about sort of tips for birding in your backyard. And what I decided to do was to select a bird that I think is probably the spunkiest backyard bird. And I think for those of you who are in Southwestern Virginia, all of you right now are within about a half a mile of a Carolina ram. And so there's a lot of birds that you sort of have to go out and find, but the Carolina wren, I love this little bird because it's funky and it comes in, it literally inserts itself into the human world. And it loves to put its nests in, you know, out in the garage if it has access or in the barn and tuck its nests in little places. So what I want to do is I want to do a little bit of combining birding with scientific ornithology and talk a little bit about the life history of this bird. So I've got a number of things I'm going to introduce you to a program um, that's free and a couple of websites that you can um, download and take a look at. So let me start with the beginning of a PowerPoint. I'm Steven? going to, yeah. So I was going to tell you too that I looked up on the iNaturalist on our project this morning and we have um, 17 observations of the Carolina ring. I think okay. Cool. Okay. So they're they're prominent. So let me let me see if I can get this put together. Um, here we go. So here's a, here's our little buddy, the Carolina wren, and probably it's familiar to a lot of you. Um, and so what I want to do is sort of march through aspects of its life history, and I want to start by introducing a ornithologist, Margaret Knight. Uh, Margaret Morse Nice, um, who was trained as a biologist, and she didn't go into academics, but she made her mark by studying birds in her backyard. And she's famous for having studied song sparrows by just going out and watching them and taking notes and banding birds so she could watch individuals and keeping track of what later on became known as the life history of the birds. At that time, ornithology was sort of more about bits and pieces. And she was one of the first people to introduce this idea that birds live in cycles and their daily cycles and their annual cycles. And really, in order to understand the whole life of the bird, we should focus on the entire cycle of the bird. So this notion of annual life histories or annual life cycles of birds comes from her. And this is just an illustration of sort of what the average year for most birds looks like. So for the little songbirds, including the Carolina wren, there's an event that they sort of all follow. And it depends on what, you know, because it's cyclical, you can start at any time of the year, but you start with sort of when they arrive at where they live. And if they're migratory birds, you know, like a tanager or, you know, a lot of the migratory birds that we know of, they arrive from their wintering ground. They begin by trying to establish a territory or returning to, they refer to this site fidelity, returning to the territory where they were before. Uh, males and females have to go through a selection process of choosing mates, um, you know, and that's, that's a real interesting area. How do they select mates? Um, how much do, are they monogamous with each other during this period? How much do they fool around with their neighbors? Because there's more of that going on than you might think. And then this process of courtship, mating, the male often guards his female to protect her from be, mating with other males. And then the process of uh, building the nest, um, incubating the kids, um, brood splitting refers to splitting the kids into two groups after they leave the nest the male and female working with them separately and then re-nesting because sometimes particularly the Carolina wren will have two and sometimes three nests in a season and then after nesting they go through this process of molting where they lose all their feathers and replace them 
And then following that, if they're a migratory species, they migrate to the wintering ground or they disperse from the natal ground. So here's the major sort of annual energy demands on these birds and they come in little packages. You know, first of all, there's what energy is needed to get through every day, you know, the food that's necessary um, for like the basal metabolic rate and then the additional food for maintaining the territory, for being vigilant and evasive for predators, et cetera, et cetera, staying out of trouble. But then each of these steps in their life history requires additional energy demand. Breeding requires more energy. Um, both the male and female have to get in condition. The female has to produce the eggs, which is a huge energy demand. The male sperm, of course, but that's not very energy intensive. And then they need additional food to take care of the young. The molting, the replacement of all these worn feathers, it isn't done all at once. They lose feathers in a regime you know, that's standardized for different species. So they might lose one feather and begin to regrow it on their wing. And as that starts to regrow, they re lose the next feather. And so sometimes this can take them as long as a month. And so it's a little bit energy intensive to do that. And then migration, I mean, if these birds migrate a long distance, um, that takes tremendous energy. And so they have to put on the fat in order to do that. And then they have to get through the winter, which for the Carolina wren is a really important um, energy challenge for it. Okay, here's a basic risk characteristics of our little friend, the Carolina wren. Um, it's one of 88 species. Uh, wrens are a new world family. Um, all of them are in North, Central, and South America. There is one that has spilled over into Europe, um, but this is a, their origin is in the new world and all of them remain here. Most of them are in the tropics. Nine of them come up into the United States. This bird is in the southeastern quadrant of North America, um, including where we are. They are not migratory. They don't leave in the winter. Um, they are monomorphic, meaning they, the male and female look the same. Um, they sing all year round, and this is one of the reasons why I picked them as our um, guest of honor, I guess you would say, is because they're findable all year round by listening for their song, and we're going to spend a little bit of time doing that. Um, they have these really loud, clear songs. They are monogamists, that is the male and female when they pair can stay together for several years, which is not typical for a lot of temperate birds. Usually they are monogamous within a nesting period, uh, sometimes within a season, but it's very rare, particularly for migratory birds to go to the south and come back and pair back up with the same female or the same male, depending on which direction you're looking at. These guys make, in, this, our, in our region here, they make two or three nests per year. It's called a dome nest because it looks like a little dome and the young are all trishal. Um, the survival rate of adults is about, about half of them don't make it through the winter. So the number of birds from year to year is about 50%. Uh, they live about 10 years at the very most. So a 10 year old wren is like a 105 year old woman and they primarily are insectivores. So this list here, the basic characteristic list, um, I'm gonna use it as a checklist to go through each of these in turn and explore it a little bit more deeply. Okay, you ready? You got your snacks? Um, here's wrens in the family. As I said, the family is New World. Um, they're mostly tropical. This page over here and this page, by the way, I made my cursor really big so you can follow it. This, and, this page and this page are from uh, Mexico. Um, this page is from Costa Rica. I think the Carolina ran, mm, it's either this one or this one. I'm not sure. You can see there's some that are really similar to each other. Um, some that have similar features but have some markings on the breast. And then this whole category over here None of these make it into Virginia. Um, this is, some of these are called the giant ran, for example, the cactus ran down in the southwestern part of the US. There's two species that are commonly found in this area, uh, the Carolina ran and the house ran. I found this picture on the internet um, from the Kiwa, Kiwa Island banding station is a, where they banned birds. This is on the coastal part of South Carolina. 
And here's a Carolina wren here, and they just were putting this picture up so people can compare Carolina wren, house wren. This is a wren that uh, is called a marsh wren. And the marsh wren is, um, it's, it's here, but it's pretty rare. Um, you don't find it very often, but it'd be more common in the coastal marshes of South Carolina. Okay, so check, got that information. Range of the Carolina wren. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time about um, talking about how we know where the ranges of these birds are and how sort of variable or conversely stable these ranges are. The Carolina wren, as I said, is non-migratory and its range, as I said, was in the southeastern quadrant of the US. And there's a little population down in the Yucatan and those populations are disjunct. Now, which leads to some interesting questions in an evolutionary sense, because these are now populations that could potentially diverge from one another over time, that is genetically, but so far it appears they have not. Okay, this distribution range map does not change winter to summer. Um, how do we know this? Well, there's a, there's a series of, I guess you would call them citizen science projects. You know, they sort of overlap with scientific projects um, over the years that target trying to understand fluctuations in bird numbers in different parts of their range. And I want to go through these sort of real quickly um, in slightly chronological order. About 150 years ago, it was a common practice in um, the Eastern United States on Christmas Day, because it was before we had gaming or television or football or anything like that, people would go out in the afternoons and they would have contests to see how many birds they could shoot. I mean, literally shoot with a shotgun and they bring home these gunny sacks full of birds. And some ornithologists um, around 1900 said, well, why don't we as an alternative go out and simply count the birds? And that gave rise to what's now known as the Christmas bird count. And the way this works is people go out on a designated day somewhere around Christmas and they spend as much time as possible counting both species and numbers of individuals of species. And that's become a hundred, a hundred year plus record of the winter presence of the birds. This goes on all over, it's mostly a North American thing, but it goes on all over the world. And so we have this long standing record of the presence of birds. There are several Christmas bird counts in this area and the Blue Ridge Discovery Center uh, sponsors one of those. That tells us where they are in the winter. And as bird populations begin to decline in the 1900s, um, people recognize that this tell, we, we know a lot about bird populations in the winter. And so they begin, this project is called the Breeding Bird Survey in the 1960s to do the same thing or a similar thing in the summer. And it works a little bit different because instead of going out on one day, the volunteer goes out to the same locations several times over the course of the summer and does the same thing. They count numbers of birds and they keep track of the number of the different species that they encounter. Okay. In time, however, and that's been, this has been remarkable because it's been going on since the 1960s and we can look at changes in the bird surveys that have been done since then, particularly the ones that have been done for a long time. People recognize, however, that the presence of birds doesn't necessarily verify that they're breeding. And so in the 1980s, people begin doing what are called state breeding bird atlases. So, and this is done a little bit different. They get volunteers to go out and spend time in a given area, not only looking at the numbers of birds and species of birds that they see, but also recording evidence that they're breeding. Now, the state of Virginia is in the fifth year of a five-year bird atlas project. This is the second atlas. The first one was in the 1980s, and this one is going on now. And there's a presentation tomorrow morning at nine o'clock by the state director of that project, Ashley Peel, who's, who's going to talk about how that works. And if people wanna participate, um, she's gonna talk about that process. Okay, there's another project and I thought I'd mention it. And this involves banding birds to not only look for breeding, 
but also to make an assessment of survival because they ban birds and keep track of whether they get recovered later on. And also the ratio of young to old birds um, because that gives us a sense of how productive they are. If there's a lot of young birds in the population, then we know that they're very productive and the reverse is true as well. And last, and this is sort of in a category by itself, is this uh, eBird, which is a website and a project. And it has its, its own sort of history, but it's become so super successful that what I wanna do is I wanna shell to it um, meaning I want to stop this and I want to go to the internet and I want to take a look at the eBird website. Now I've got a link for it up here, but I'm going to just Google it so you can find it, eBird. Okay, and this is a, they have a phone app for it and there's a website here and let's go to that website. Okay, so eBird um, is a project that was started at Cornell University, the Laboratory of Ornithology at Cornell, which is, a, you know, here's their logo up here, um, has been very good at sort of public outreach and education and citizen science and, you know, trying to engage with the public, buying, trying to be sort of ambassadors for birds, I think is a good way to put it. And they have tapped into the tendency by bird watchers to go out and do lists of birds. So if we had been able to do the live naturalist rally today, what we would have done is we would have gone out and spent the morning identifying what birds we saw or heard, and we would keep a list of the birds that we saw and heard during the course of the morning. And probably usually what we do at the end of the morning as we go back through the list of birds, you know, hoping everybody got a chance to see them and, you know, maybe learn some tips about identification, et cetera. So what the Cornell people did is they said, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we create a website where people can take those lists? Because usually those lists ends up, in, they end up in the wastebasket or the dresser drawer or something like that. You know, people, naturalists sometimes keep their lists in a notebook or, but a lot of them end up sort of nothing really happens to those lists. So they said, let's create a site where people could go. They can put a dot on a map, put information about how much time they were out there and the, you know, the, when they started in the morning, just a little bit about the effort they put in and, and put their list on this website. And in time, we start accumulating records of all of these bird watchers, not only in this region, but all over the planet. And this has been so phenomenally successful that now it's become this huge resource of information about where birds are. And that's why I wanna show it to you because what you, and I invite you to come and look at this site. See, I'm logged in here already and it has species that I've observed, et cetera. But what I wanna do is show you how this works and then we'll look at the Carolina rent. So when you look at Explore, you could submit your own observations, but when you look at explore, you could explore areas, they call them hot spots where people see a lot of birds. You can restore, you can explore particular regions, like you can say, well, what do people see up on Mount Rogers? So you could look at the Mount Rogers region. You could look at photos and sounds because not only can you put your list in here, now with the availability of excellent photography equipment, and now everybody has a sound recording device, namely their Android or their iPhone in their pocket. People include these with their lists. So let me just put something, you know, at random, Tanager, and you'll see it's also an interesting exploration in diversity. You know, this is one of the things I've learned over the years is that people are, I'm, I'm reluctant to use the word ignorant, but they're unaware of how diverse some of these birds are here. So we have two tanagers here, the scarlet and the summer tanager. And here's all the tanagers, most of these, this is how many species of tanager there are. So if we pick one at random here, the orange-throated tanager, here's the orange-throated tanager. And what it gives is uh, information that's on a range, you know, gives a range map for where people, this looks like it's not very, widely distributed. 
There have been 249 observation in lists, 40 photos, and 16. So this is not a real common species, but when we when we look at the map, it gives us a real clear idea of where people are seeing it. You know, if we zoom out, here's South America. They're right here where Ecuador and, and Peru come together. Looks like they're in the mountains rather than down. And what they do is they divide the world into this grid and they put these purple markings that indicate a little bit the density. This is the frequency of times that people see them when they're in this area. So it gives a little bit of an index. And as you zoom in further, it shifts over to individual dots. Okay, so there's in common, but it may be an area, oh, it's saying my internet connection is unstable, which is not good. This is an area where it may be easy for people to get into. And in fact, you can see it's right along the road. You click on one of these, it shows you the record of their entry. This person, Jonathan Fenstra, it looks like, had a list on this date in 2016. And if you click on the date, it gives you his list. So here's the list of what he saw there. Okay, here's one of his pictures, golden-headed mannequin he saw. Um, here's a little tyrant that he saw. So he didn't take a lot of pictures, but he had a pretty good list of birds. Anyway, I'm just showing you how this works. <laughs> let's go, let's go, uh, let's, let's head back to the Carolina Wren. So, okay, explore. Oops. All right, back to our guest of honor, the Carolina Wren. So here's the Carolina Wren um, in the eBird. And again, these photographs are um, submitted by, they're, they're just, these are just bird watchers. I mean, more and more researchers are using this, but these are mostly bird watchers. You know, in this case, here's the person's name. Here's their list that they submitted this picture. And what a beautiful picture this person took. So they have pictures. Here's the Carolina Wren information down here. 4.3 million observations of the Carolina Wren. Um, they're easier to get to, the Carolina Wrens, than the tanagers we looked at. 24,000 photographs and 4,000 recordings, audio recordings of them. And if we look at the map, this map sort of corresponds to, see the darkest part corresponds pretty much to the map that I showed you in the PowerPoint. Now, there are some records of Carolina wrens that are very lost, like up here in Winnipeg and you know, up here in Quebec and you know, that kind of thing up here in Prince Edward Island, but the majority of them are down here. And again, when you zoom in far enough, you start to find individual dots showing where people have recorded these. Okay, so let me zoom in here. Here is, I'm zooming all the way into where we would be if we were birding up there this morning. Here's the Conorock Community Center and here's the Blue Ridge Discovery Center. So here's records. Um, Eva Floyd is the director's mother, I think, and her record here. And so these are records that people have put around. Well, here's the Blue Ridge Discovery Center, et cetera. Um, and so these, I don't know who this is, Holly Higgins, some visitor up there. And likewise, these are, um, well, this, see, May 13th is the list that Ashley and I put together because we did the birding workshop at the Naturalist Rally in 2017, at which we saw Carolina ran. Okay, so I'm just showing you the site because it's this amazing sort of storehouse. And I also mentioned the breeding bird atlas. Do we want to play around with this anymore here? I also mentioned the breeding bird atlas because the breeding bird atlas, which is going on, is a subset of eBird. Oh, here, let me show you one other thing, which is Part of the reason I picked these Carolina wrens is they're 
they're in town. You know, here's Meadowview. Here, you know, here people are reporting them in the middle of town. You know, here they are probably getting their nails done at the Martha Washington Spa. But look at here, they're over at the farmers market. You know, here's one. It's at the Martha Washington, probably serving it as part of their lunch buffet. Here's one. You know, probably, and sometimes these are in people's backyards. You know, here's one in this February. Here's two Carolina wrens. Not a long list, but these look like what you would see in somebody's backyard. Okay, and the breeding bird atlas is a subset of the eBird. And here I've got it linked right here. Here's the the breeding bird atlas portal it's called and we can take a look at again the Carolina Wren and what this includes is not only the presence of these birds but information about their breeding so as this loads up here you can see down here in this corner the categories of breeding confirmed breeder meaning they found a nest or they found young birds, probable, like a pair in the right habitat in the middle of summer is their probable, possible is like a singing male. And you can see these colors, black means that it's confirmed. And again, we can sort of go down in our neck of the woods here and look for uh, uh, verifications. Um, when you zoom in, the points include the categories of breeding. So C is confirmed, R is probable, P is possible, and let's pick, pick one over. This is Sugar Grove, confirmed record. Oh, it's Ashley Peel. Um, Ashley Peel, she's out and about looking at birds. And this little thing over here means she wrote a note. So on the 15th of June, she saw Carolina Wren carrying food. She said two hidden fledglings, meaning probably these were young that were hiding in the bushes or something like that. Okay, so there's Eber. Let's go back to our program. eBird gives presence and doesn't really give breeding evidence unless it's part of the atlas. And I'll pitch the, the atlas tomorrow, the webinar tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. And I'm sure that you have information about how to participate in that. Okay, so let's look at the Carolina Wren and back to the fact that it is not a migratory species because here's, the breeding bird survey, which is summer, and this is the density map based on the breeding bird surveys. And you can see that the densest are the, this, the Atlantic states down here, I'm sorry, the Gulf states down here. And then as you go north, you can see that the edge of the range, they start to get pretty uncommon. See, they see on average less than one bird every time they go out. And likewise, when we look at the Christmas bird count, which is winter, summer, this is winter down here, it almost looks identical. So that the birds are not really shifting winter to summer. And this is in contrast, here's the Carolina Wren down here at the bottom and for reference point. This is in contrast to birds, and I picked these birds because they're a little bit different. This is the field sparrow, which is we see here all year round. So it is a winter resident and it is a summer resident, but it, as the pop between summer and winter, the population shifts. So in the summer, see this is red in the breeding season, the whole population shifts to the north. And in the winter, the whole population shifts to the south. So there are places like up here in Minnesota and Wisconsin where they only see them in the summer. And there's places down here, like in look, it looks like Gainesville and Central Florida and coastal Louisiana, where they only see them in the winter. And then this purple is year round. Okay, the other category is migrants. Now, because this population shifts and doesn't pass through, there's a, there's a, you don't see this yellow, which is only during migration. And the Swainson's thrush is a really good dramatic example of this, where it breeds across Canada and then down the West Coast and a little bit into the Rockies. And then it migrates all the way down to South America, up the Andes, up the spine of the Sierra Madres into Mexico. And the only time we see them here in Virginia is right now when they're passing through from winter to their breeding grounds. And in fact, I saw one this week out on my farm. So this is the only time we get to see the Swainson's thrush. Okay, 
if you think about it from the point of view of birding, then you can divide birds into these categories of encounter. Birds you see any time of the year, either they're the same birds because they don't move, or they're different individuals like towhees that move, but you're still seeing the same species. Birds that are only here in the summer, like the wide-eyed vireo, we don't see them in the winter. Birds that are the converse, which we only see them in the winter, and then they go north, like the white-throated sparrow, and then the passage migrants, like the Swainson's thrush. And then there are these other categories, like birds that only come in when, for example, if there's a, a food crash to the north, you know, then they shift to the south, or birds that migrate altitudinally. The junco is in high elevations in summer and comes in lower elevations in the wintertime, and then birds that are basically lost. You know, they get blown out of the way by uh, uh, a hurricane or some kind of weather event um, and scissor tail flycatcher. There was a record, um, I don't know if they're still there, but Egyptian geese, a pair of Egyptian geese was on a pond out in Withville, and maybe you heard about that, which is pretty rare. They're an African species, um, and for reasons unknown, maybe a hurricane, um, they ended up in Withville. So when we look at not the average map of the breeding bird survey, but actually the trend, how this changes over 40 years of the breeding bird survey, and we look at where the changes occur the most, for the Carolina wren, they occur right at the northern edge of the range. And so the Carolina wren shows this interesting pattern where they're the number of birds per route that you see tracks the winter temperature because they're very sensitive to temperature. Now remember, wrens are tropical species and the ones that have sort of adapted to moving north are still sensitive to these winter temperatures. And the Carolina wren, um, in years when it's extremely severe, the, the severe winter will completely knock out the population. And then it takes a little while for them to shift back to the north to recolonize. Now, two things. One is, I was in Indiana at this, at this point. I had moved there to, to go to graduate school, and this winter completely eliminated the Carolina wren population there, and it took about four years before anybody saw any Carolina wrens. Okay, so you may be thinking to yourself, well, if they're not a migratory species, then what is this about movements to the north recolonizing? And so I'll just take a moment to distinguish between migration, which is the whole population shifting, usually seasonally, primarily because of resources, and dispersal. So when the, when the pair nests and they produce four kids, then the four kids grow up and they become independent. Well, then those kids have to find a place to live. Okay, so the most logical thing, because they, well, their parents are in that territory. So that if they shift next door, well, there may be wrens in that territory. So they might shift, you know, some of them ideally can find a place nearby and they can go like, you know, a half a kilometer or a kilometer or something like that. But some of them go like 20 miles away. And if you think about it in the northern edge of the range, the open territories are mostly to the north. And so there's the slow movement of a few miles a year that's the edge of this shifting population to the north. And with climate change, what we're seeing is the winters are getting less and less severe. And we're seeing that the Carolina wren is a good index of this shifting climate. So in the 1980s, if you look the open circles here, these are the breeding bird survey routes. The yellow circles are the lowest encounter rate. And then, you know, down here, see down in, you know, the edge of Virginia, they're seeing 25 to 70 birds every time they go out. I mean, that's how dense the Carolina wrens are there. But look at New York. There's almost no birds in New York in the 80s. But by the beginning of the 2000s, look how they've, they've spread into New York here. So you're seeing this shift. They're even up on the other side of the lake in, in uh, Ontario. You know, likewise, the breeding bird atlas of New York shows a similar pattern where there's none in upstate in either time period, but during the 80s, there's, there's a smattering, I guess would be the word out here in the Finger Lakes area. There's a lot in this area around the populated areas and out on Long Island, but look at the change here, how they've, 
how many that there are detected here. They've gone up the Hudson Valley here and how many there are out in the Finger Lakes and virtually all of Long Island. And I'm, birds are a good index of climate change because while as a culture we argue in quotes this whether or not it's happening, the birds are reacting to it. And this is happening all over the world. Their arrival dates are changing. Here's hummingbirds. Um, the early nesting dates are going down for a lot of birds. This is as late, long ago as the 90s, and these have gone back even earlier and earlier. And I've got, you know, we, we're going to jump over this because of time, but there's all these places where, and this is a big hot area of research in ornithology, birds are reacting to climate change by changing their ranges, by changing their population centers, shifting them to the north, et cetera. So, okay, back to our little critter here. David? Non migratory. Yeah. Lisa, have, go ahead. Yeah, we have a quick question from Monica. It says, can we be sure that there are really more birds in New York now? Or is there a chance we just have stronger data now? Uh, given the numbers, it's pretty clear that there are more birds there now. Because you can adjust for the number of observers. See, these, these uh, bird atlases, you keep track of how much effort is being put into the field. And so you can look at the number of birds as a function of the effort that's put in. And when you adjust for that, then yes, you see an increase in those birds. Did you follow that? So it isn't just that there are more observers out here. It's that when you adjust for effort, you see that they're shifting further to the north. Furthermore, the records of how far they are out of range have gone up as well. Okay, so let's does that answer the question? Do you yep. want to? Yes, okay. yes, thank you. Monomorphic, I'm just going to address that really quick because monomorphic means the male and female looks the same. This one here, I can't tell if it's a male or female. I'm guessing it's a male because it's in the posture of singing. Um, Rose-breasted grosbeak, I took this at my feeder this week. They are shifting through. Here's the male, here's the female. Um, I had a whole bunch of them at my feeder. This is bunting, indigo bunting. Here's the male, here's the female. Um, these are sexually dimorphic rather than monomorphic. Um, that's interesting about dimorphism versus monomorphism. Um, that, that's a whole nother webinar there about sexual selection and you know mating systems and that kind of thing. Mark that down, Lisa. The next I webinar. will. I will. We're yeah, gonna another that. another webinar. So this guy's a year-round singer, and I want to spend a little time with the song because this is funny. Now, um, with this is fun. I, over the years, because I've studied birdsong for a long time, and I do a lot of these programs, um, and there's a handful of things that I'm always sort of surprised that people don't know. And I guess another way to say it is, it's always interesting to me because there's a few things about their singing that people are surprised to hear. And one of those is that when you're hearing songs, bird songs in this area, and this isn't 100% true, but in temperate areas, mostly those are males. In other words, the males do the singing and the females don't. And that's true of Carolina wrens. Males sing, females do not. Now in the interest in, of me being a sexist, there are female vocalizations that the male doesn't make. And there are vocalizations that they both do. And so what I want to do is, if you can get this song, you know, the other thing is that people are always asking me, like, how can I learn the song of the Carolina Wren or of anything? And when you, when you say the word the, you put it in quotes, because there isn't the song, there's not dozens of songs, there are thousands of songs. And people are often surprised, they're like, what? Thousands of songs. And that's one of the amazing things about these little critters. You know, so there are hundreds of songs in the population and thousands of songs across the country. And each male has multiple songs. And so what you have to do is not learn the song, but learn sort of the pattern. Okay, so I got a couple of slides that I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit about. These birds are they have what's called a classic type A territory, which is that the male is very territorial. If you bring if another male starts singing in his presence, he blitzes over there and attacks them, you know. And 
Well, some people are opposed to this. I think one way to see a Carolina Wren is to go outside with your iPhone and look up Carolina Wren song on YouTube and play it back or on uh, eBird. And the Carolina Wren will come over there and let you know that it is not happy to hear you there. Now, I should say that some people are opposed to that because they think it's sort of like bird harassment. But the reality is, you know, these aren't endangered birds and they habituate to it. In time, they'll go away and ignore you because they, they learn that this is not another bird. It's a, it's a pesky human. The females can be aggressive, but in general, they are not. Okay, this is a bird that's called in bird song terminology, an eventual variety singer. So it repeats one song type over and over and over in what's called a bout. And then it usually pauses and then it starts another bout and sings another song type over and over and over. And it sings any time of the year, which is great. And they're, they're um, I love these guys because like when it's, when it's after a big heavy rain, then the Carolina Wren's all sing to just sort of let everybody know that they made it through the rain. I love this photograph, by the way, this woman, Melissa Jane. I took this off of eBird. I mean, it's sort of a fair, when you sign up for eBird, you, you, you acknowledge that if it's a fair use, other people can use your media and stuff. So I would never get a picture that's quite that good. I did get some of these recordings up. So the Carolina Wren song is rendered usually as a triple set of triplets. And when you try and put it to words, because that's another thing people always ask me, like, what words is this bird? Well, the bird isn't saying any words, but we want to put words to their song and the words, the songs can be rendered like, you know, these are, I found all of these in the literature. I didn't make any of them up. Tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle, video, video. They tend to be, they tend to be like triple or quadruple triplets. Chubledy, 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 like that. Germany, Germany, chi wordle, chi wordle. See, and if you, if you can get that in your head, if you can get those sounds in your head like an earworm, then you can go out in your backyard when you're having your afternoon cocktail during happy hour and listen, and you can hear Carolina Wrens. Because believe me, wherever you are, they're in your backyard. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to get out of this again, if I can. Let me see. And I'm going to introduce you to a program here, which is called Audacity. And this is a, a free program that you can download and all the documentation. But this is a, like Word is a word processor for um, words. This is a, a imaging and editing software for sounds. And so if we go, go back here and I'm going to show you some, let's start with the alarm calls that they both make. Let me see if I can find them in here. Um, here's some alarm calls. I recorded these near a nest by putting a little tape recorder near the nest. So the depiction here is in the horizontal axis is time. And in this case, the vertical axis up and down here is its sound intensity or amplitude. And you don't see the frequency information, but you can convert it to frequency information like this. So this is frequency on this axis, and this is time. And so let's listen to this, and hopefully the audio will come through. It's sort of a harsh and raspy sound. You can sort of tell that they're not very happy. This is the alarm call. that's enough. Lisa, can you hear that? Yep. Okay. Okay. So let me, let me uh, close that out here. I've got some other alarm calls, but I want to just go back here and I'll show you. The female makes these calls that are called dit calls. And she also does this buzzy or rattly call, which is considered to be an appeasement call. If the males are fighting, they get pretty intense. And the female makes this rattle call to let both of them know that she's not the other male. Because remember, they look the same and she doesn't want to get her eyes poked out, I guess. So let's take a look at the female. Let me see if I can find, I have to go through my, um, here's the buzz or the, this is the appeasement call of the female. And this is, 
It's really distinctive, okay? And they, they make it, when you get on eBird, you can find people have recordings of this where the male is singing and the female makes this right over the top of his singing. Okay. And the other one, let me see if uh, I can find the, uh, here we go, the female, the dit calls of the female. This was near the nest. Um, yeah. So these are little calls, they're not very loud. And so they're, they're not the ones that are gonna, they're, you know, you can see the double, the double note here. These are the ones that are not gonna really grab your attention, okay? Um, the one that's gonna grab your attention is the male song, the tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle, that kind of thing. So let me, here's one that I recorded at Saltville. Let's start with this one. So here's the, here's the Carolina Wren song sequence. And I've got, the cursor doesn't show up very well here. Here's one song and then a little bit of time. Remember what we said, they sing these song bouts song number one, song number two. I'm gonna show you the sonogram of these and we're gonna to listen to this. Video, 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 tea kettle, tea kettle. Okay, and just in the spirit of what I was saying, there isn't the song let me find another one here. This one I recorded in my backyard. Now some of the, let me go to the sonogram here. Um, these chips in the background are like this one here and this one here, these are cardinals. Um, but here's the, you can see the song of the Carolina Wren. So let's listen to this sequence here. It's a little faster, but it's filled with jubilee, jubilee. Okay, and if we, if we take one of these songs and we blow it up, our ear usually hears it as three notes, deedly, deedly, or tweedly, tweedly, or jubilee, or Germany, but it isn't necessarily, here's the, here's the song I've, I've blown up, but if we slow this down, I mean, I got a little thing out of move. If we slow this down, people love this, I'll tell you and listen to it in slow-mo, you can hear all the individual pieces. Can you hear that? Is that loud enough? I can turn it up a little bit. Yep, I can hear it on my end. Okay. See, because it's actually four and not three. And so to help get, and again, if you get on eBird, you can listen to 30 different versions of these songs. So you can get not the song in your head, but the pattern in your head. And so in order to do that, um, what I did, let me see, here we go, is I edited in, now this is not a natural sequence, but I put, how many of these, six different songs back to back so you can hear them all sort of one after the next. Okay, we'll listen to the whole thing. Again, this is an artificial sequence. A, a, a bird would not naturally do this. See the jubilee, jubilee, jubilee. See the doodly, doodly, doodly. This one's really high pitched. But see again, it's the same jubilee, jubilee, jubilee. That was very fast. See, that's more like it goes. See, the last one, this one here, sort of, it's it's not so much jubilee because that sounds like it goes up, but it goes down, you know, at the, these aren't these great? I love these little guys. You could just play with these all day long. And let me slow this one down here and we'll listen. It's just, it's so elegant. Listen to this.
See, and it's more than just three repetitions. Aren't they, aren't they great? And you can, you know, this, they call this like, here's the unit here that repeats right here. You can see that again repeats right here. And they refer to this as a syllable. And this is referred to as an element. So we got one, two, three, four, five syllables, each with one, two, three, four, five, six elements in this song. Yeah. See, now I could do this all day long, but I'm gonna, we're gonna go back to the, we're gonna go back to the presentation here. So let's, I think I did all of these. Oh no, I didn't do the trill. Um, the male makes another call and this one, he also makes pretty often and it's either called a trill or a trying to find it here or the they call it the cheer vocalization and the cheer vocalization well it sounds like they're saying cheer and when you here let me look at the let me look at the sonogram here and this is another one if you learn this call you hear it in your yard because they make it a lot. And you can see it goes down in pitch and it's actually a repetition. See, if I slow it down, you can hear that it's a trill. It's a descending dee, 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 like that. It sounds like sort of a laugh. Okay. It, it almost sounds like a turkey too. It does, and when the slow mo version of it, that's right. It sounds like a turkey. So here's a question from Jim. Um, it okay. Says, do the male Carolina wrens ever sing those shorter songs attributed to the female, or is that a sure way to ID female from male? Okay. the The buzz is always a female because that's a female appeasement. The male never does that, and the little the did it did it did it that one. Young males make that sometimes, but as an adult, that's exclusively female as well. So yes, when you hear when you hear the rattle, then it's definitely a female because that's an only female sound. Okay, so you know, with a little bit more familiarity with those, the chubaldi, chubaldi, chubaldi. If you can get that in your head, you can find these little guys here. So I can. I'm looking at the time here. Um, and I know that I have a little bit more time than an hour, but what's your call, Lisa? I can go another 10 or 15 minutes. You want to do that or you want to ask the participants? Uh, we or, can ask the participants. So if everybody was to, wants to continue, then I can maybe, do like another 10 more minutes of information here. Okay, then maybe give me a hand raise. And while you're doing that, I can say, you know, the, to talk about the functions of song. The main reason that the males use that song is to keep track of their neighbors. And it's an interesting phenomenon because the researchers refer to it as the deer enemy rules because right. these, these birds know their neighbors and they know them because they recognize their songs. And if the neighbor stays where he's supposed to be and you stay where you're supposed to be, then it's sort of like this you know, peaceful coexistence. And so they sing back and forth just to say, I'm still here. And then they sing back and say, I'm still here. And so as long as things don't change, you know, and neither of them go into the other's territory, then there's no trouble. But if they go over into their territory, then there can be problems. I mean, they literally fight with each other. Um, there's also other functions as well. So what are we doing here? We're we gonna okay. So we have we have about half the attendees say that go go for it, um, okay. and the rest, if you didn't want to, um, if you need to go to do something else, that's fine. You can drop off. Um, and, but I think we go on for a few more minutes if you're okay. good with it. I'm also, gonna yeah. Just, just a quick chat note was from uh, Keith Andrews. He said that he had the door open and had birds outside respond to the calls that they could hear from his computer. There you go. See see how easy that was here. So I, let me just tell you a little bit about nesting. These guys build a dome nest. You can see it back here. This is on, and they love to tuck them into the corners of places. See, this is a junky shelf in, in our back porch, you know, and, and here's a close up of the baby birds in there. And they love to do this. These are pictures, you know, off of eBird of here's a nest that's tucked into a shelf. And here's one in a, a little cowboy hat. Um, here's one in a tin can that was outside at my house. And they're, 
what they do is it takes them about, well, on average, about 30 days um, to do a nest. It takes four or five or six days to build a nest. They have four to six eggs, <coughs> usually four or five. It takes about 14 days to hatch the babies. It takes about 13 days to feed them in the nest. And then they usually feed the babies after they leave the nest. Here's um, like means from this article, um, clutch size average about four and a half eggs, four kids. This has to do with the difference in hatching rates. And then their numbers are sort of similar. They say the, um, the nesting cycle takes about 29 days. So they devote 29 days to raising the kids. And just quick distinction between altricial, <coughs> which is birds that are um, naked at birth and require attention and feeding from the parents. Sorry, I need to get a drink here. I'm talking too much. And precocial, which is birds that when they pop out of the egg, they're really to, ready to wander off. These are up at the salt mill pond. And here's, <coughs> excuse me, these are vireos, but here's what they look like at hatching. And then here's eight days, you know, and the growth chart is typical for most of these birds like this. And this is just different patterns of altricial to precocial. <coughs> so I was gonna show you how to find research information, um, but I'm gonna skip over that and just show you Here's a plot of the survival across years. And with the exception of one year, about half of the birds make it from winter to summer. Um, the survivor survivorship, and that's typical for small birds, a little bit lower for some of the migratory birds. Um, and this is sort of the timing of breeding they, from March and then molting in the, in the fall. And so I'm not going to talk about the patterns, but I'm down here. The last on the checklist is they're primarily insectivores, which is a good opportunity to segue to the next rally webinar, which is about insects. Um, Sean Kurtzman, I think it's at four o'clock, an hour from now. Yeah. You can ask him about how tasty these are for birds. And I'm going to end with sort of a humorous note on the Carolina wren, which is in the 1990s, South Carolina decided to honor the Carolina wren by putting the wren on their license plate, which they did in 1990. And the Automobile License Plate Collectors Association, and who knew there even was one, honored it as the plate of the year in the 1990s. Only it turns out that the picture that they put was not a Carolina wren, it was a song sparrow that they had painted a white line on for the ice drop. But people recognized this. They said, wait a minute, that's not a Carolina red. And so the state of South Carolina issued stickers and they mailed them out to everybody to put over the top of the sparrow. So they actually correctly honored the Carolina wren. So, oh, that's with, so that, funny. with that note, I'll open it up to questions. Thank right, you, you, have, you, have, you have several, Stephen. So Nora Cox asks, she says, I have a couple each year. Are these likely the same couple for years? Yes, how many they are. Years, how many years might the same couple nest near my house? Um, like three or four. Um, they can, the oldest one is tan. Let me see if I can go back up here so you can see me. I can't figure out how to. Just stop sharing your screen, I think. Okay. Thank yeah, there you. you go. Um, probably on average two or three years, they would be together. And yes, they would be the same birds, but up to five or six years. If you think about 50% of them live for one year. So if you have two that are, let's say two years old, one of those two is likely to die over the winter, you know, and then of though, you know, of the, if you say, if you have a hundred birds, that means 50 of them are still alive the next year. And some of those can be pairs that have, that have both survived the winter. And I would say that there's a gradient from south to north about um, morbidity or mortality um, survival. Um, so it could be two or three or four years that it's the same birds in your backyard. Cool. Monica Hall says she has a question about nests. Do they make multiple nests and how does that work? They made one on my porch, but didn't use it. 
but okay. some house wrens seem to be hanging around a lot. Okay, well, house wrens, <clears throat> house wrens have a different mating system and they are polygynous, meaning males have multiple females and they're migratory. So the male house wren comes in and he picks cavities because they're a cavity nester. They'll nest in boxes and tree cavities and that kind of thing, um, fence post holes and fence posts. Um, and he makes what are called dummy nests. And he makes three or four or five of them, you know, as many as that. And then he shows them to the female as part of his enticement to get her to pair with him. But if she pairs and decides to nest, he can make more and attract another female. But see, the Carolina wren doesn't do that. They're monogamous and they're faithful to each other. They don't fool around all that much. A lot of these little birds are fooling around when you do the genetics testing, you're finding the four eggs in this nest. One of them, the dad is from over there. You know, so you know that they're sneaking around a little bit. Carolina wrens, if they make a nest, they either commit to it or they abandon it. And they don't make more than one at the same time. So if they made one and they decided to not use it, it's probably because something found it. Maybe a kitty cat or maybe a little Scotty dog messed with it or something <laughs> like that. I say that because Monica has a little Scotty dog. <clears throat> or... And so they decided that it was not a safe place after all. And so they probably shifted to somewhere else. So that brings me to a question about okay. that. So you said that the, the Carolina Wren, um, I guess they have three clutches a summer or a, a breeding season? They, they can. They in the same nest? Right. I've, I've had them on my farm already nest and the young are already fledged. And so they can, you know, here it's the, what is it, the 8th of May, 9th of May, they could do another one if they started, so let's say they started a week from now, remember it's 29 days, they could be done the second week of June and do another one. And so three is about the most that they can handle, but they will, if they lost, like if they start this nest and then a snake comes and eats the eggs, they'll reset takes a few days to reset, find a new place, then re-nest. And they can re-nest sometimes four or five times in a season. So they can, in some cases, do three successful nests in a season. Okay. I have a person named Jim, and Jim would like to speak, I think. So he's raised his hand. I don't know if okay. it was an accident on purpose, but Jim, I have you um, able to talk if you would like to ask a question. Is Jim trustworthy? I'm not sure. But he does. He needs to unmute. I can't seem to unmute him. So maybe yeah, I, maybe I see not. Jim up here. He's Jim. You need to unmute your. If he wants to ask a question. So we'll move on. Though we have Steve Linderman made a comment about um, that she that they love the closed pin bag in his oh, yeah. room. <clears throat> yeah, that'd be perfect. I had a well, one of those one of those cloth shopping bags and it was hanging by one handle and they put a nest in there and my son-in-law had one to put it in his boot on the porch. Huh. They love these little containers. It's easy to make nest boxes for them. You just, you know, that I've had them nest in an oat, a little oatmeal box is perfect. And the researchers, they take PVC pipe that's about six inches in diameter, five or six inches in diameter and cut about 10 inches and block one end of it and they'll put a nest in there. They take them pretty readily. Sweet. Um, Mark Metz says that, or Mertz, I'm sorry, said they nested in an empty bird feeder at his place last year. Yeah, as long as there's a little cavity. Yeah, they, they love those little cavities. Yeah, and that's what I say, what I said at the very beginning is one of the things I like about the Carolina Wren and why I nominated it for our guest of honor was that they insert themselves into our lives. You know, we don't always have to go out and find them. They come and, and bring themselves to us. And it's sort of fun to watch them. You know, once they, once they lay eggs, they're pretty committed and it's hard to get them to abandon. So you can go and hear all of the alarm calling and that kind of thing. Because if you go out there, you know, they'll, they'll come out and make a fuss at you. Right. So one more question and let's call it. Um, okay. I don't, I just have two comments that I'll mention them real quick. It says, I found her, Tanya says she found a wren's nest that was built around another bird's nest. Each had nests, each nest had eggs in it. 
Wow, interesting. <laughs> yeah, and then Nora Cox says an old mailbox used for a few years, an upside down canoe until Kat saw it, then they dismantled it and took oh. material elsewhere. Yeah, okay, there you go. Yeah, well, thanks for, for tuning in. Go on eBird and listen to the songs and get them in your ear. And once you learn that song, then these, these birds are accessible. I like them because they're, you hear them, year, they're one of the very few birds that sings all winter long. And so this is a really good backyard bird to do in this time of sequestration to really pay attention to the birds in your backyard. Thanks everybody for coming around. Thanks Lisa for Thank you Stephen for being here today. Thanks everybody for attending and I'll see you at four. <laughs>